Uh, I'm Jen Strader, uh, and I'll be giving this presentation today. If you'd like to follow along, the slides are posted on GitHub. There should be an automated tweet that went out a few minutes ago as well uh, with those links. There are some previous versions of this talk as well. Uh, I'll, I've snapshotted this and it'll go on, on here as well. So a little bit about me, uh, and we'll go from there. Professionally, I'm a senior consultant at Object Partners. Object Partners is a consulting firm out of Minneapolis, Minnesota in the USA. We specialize in Groovy and Grails consulting uh, and do a variety of other things as well. It was a good fit for me because I do see myself as a full stack engineer. I've done some front end, some back end, some database work. I have a variety of different experiences. You may also recognize me as the co-founder of Great Ladies. So Great Ladies is the organization for the support of women that use Groovy, Grails, Griffin, Gradle, any of the Groovy related technologies. Uh, we currently have a chapter in the United States and are definitely open to expanding to other areas. I uh, got some stuff here and we'll definitely uh, talk about that as we go through this presentation. Uh, like I said, I, I am from the US. I've moved around a little bit, but I'm currently out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's uh, that red one all the way in the middle. I'm a graduate of Hamilton College, which is also in the United States, and there are some links to connect on social media if you're interested, as well as the GitHub. Um, the links as well, sorry. The agenda for this talk is to kind of start out, make sure everybody's on the same page. This is a very introductory talk. Uh, and so we're going to do a re review of kind of what we think of with relational databases. I have uh, an example from Great Ladies using Grails 3. Uh, and I'm going to go very low level or very uh, introductory definitions of NoSQL, some different types of databases, and I uh, should get to an example where I'm going to take my example application and then substitute Mongo and substitute Redis. Just a little bit of scope. Uh, this is about my experience as a developer. Uh, it's not about every aspect of every NoSQL solution, uh, and it's not about the infrastructure side, so implementation, maintenance, or scaling. So let's get started. When we think of relational databases, we usually think of things that are tabular, that have defined schemas, and relationships between data. We're familiar with terms like database or table, that tables have rows and columns. OK. So to get started on our application, um, I've got a little bit of review here. We shouldn't need the Groovy or the Grails. But if you aren't familiar, there are a couple changes that you may see when we go through the Grails 3 application. So Grails 3 is now based on Spring Boot, and it switched to Gradle for the build system. The things you may see uh, as we go through this are the structural changes to configuration. OK. So my example task was to take some of the Great Ladies products. So I have t-shirts stickers, some coffee mugs, the different things that I get from different vendors. And the idea was to aggregate those into kind of a product catalog uh, and have some kind of a shopping cart functionality. Uh, just an example, uh, rather than using your standard traditional book author uh, paradigm, wanted to make it a little more uh, close to home for me. Okay. So let's get out of here and take a look at the code. So the first thing I'm going to want to do, I'm going to go ahead and run the app in the background while we're looking at the code. So this isn't necessarily uh, the way that you might implement this, but I wanted to show some examples of different uh, ideas. So we have, starting out with a product, so you have some strings. I've got a vendor here uh, that ha just has a, if we look at this, 
actually, I should put this in presentation mode so you can actually see it. Okay, so a relationship here, uh, if I go back to my product. And then I wanted to show a one-to-many relationship, so we have uh, price-quantity relation, which for me meant that um, as you buy more products, the vendors give you a different unit price. So there's a relationship between the price and how many of something that you're, you're getting. Uh, hopefully this should look familiar to, to most people. The other aspect was the cart aspect. So a cart, I'm being very lazy here and using the user session as a unique identifier and have a uh, one-to-many relationship here as well with items that are in the cart. Cart item. Okay. So that's the main uh, aspects of the code. I've used generated uh, controllers just to kind of get a basic UI going. So let's get out of here. Hopefully we have, yep, this running on 8080. Okay, so this is, I'm not a UI person, <laughs> uh, very standard, a uh, little bit of customization. So I have a few different products here. The stickers, they usually come in sheets. and. Uh, some of the things to notice here is that some of these fields are filled in, some aren't. Uh, and then I have, so if you buy 20 or 40, the price changes. So I'm going to add something to the cart. I go in, and we can see that everything's in there. So let's take a look if we go to the DB console, which is the, so this is uh, accessing your, the general H2 database that comes by default. And this is cut off here. Is this visible? Okay. So generally we think of having these things and they get mapped into a, a tabular form. So we have our, what you'd expect, we have Vendor is a reference to the ID of the vendor, and then there are some other fields in here as well. Some of these are null, some are filled in. Uh, this is generally just out of the box how we do relational, uh, an example like this. Okay. So let's kind of flip that a little bit and talk about NoSQL. So first, what is NoSQL? Or you may call it NoSQL as well. It means not only SQL. So originally, or historically, you may have heard it as not SQL, but it's a little more than that now. It's about a group of data storage solutions that just aren't relational database systems. This is usually done by making it schemaless and or non-relational. Some of the goals of NoSQL uh, are to increase the volume of requests and the velocity uh, of the, the data solution. When we think about NoSQL, uh, they get broken down into several different types. The first kind of type here is an aggregate store and can include things like key value stores, document databases, or column or column families, you may hear them called. Graph databases I've kind of separated out here because they are very different from the, the aggregate stores but are a valid uh, NoSQL option as well. And this is an overview. There are several other types, and sometimes some of the solutions may fit into one or more of these categories. Uh, it's not as clear-cut for all of them. So let's start with the key value store. So a key value store is uh, a key and a, a value related in a, a, a lookup way. It's very simple, very basic form uh, that you can use for a variety of different things. Some support strings, or you can even have uh, 
sets or maps or other uh, data types in uh, your value section. The other, one of the other things is you could have uh, URLs in here like an image lookup. So people may use key value stores for things like caching, uh, transient data, the um, place where I was at before was using it to handle some of our session data. Uh, just, just very simple things there. Uh, an image store is a, another solution as well. So when you think about uh, key value stores, you may have heard of some of these things like Memcached or DynamoDB. And then the one I'm going to use for my example is Redis. And I do have Redis in here with an asterisk, because uh, it is one of those that kind of fits into a few different things. It's not just a key value store. They um, think, maybe misquoting this, there's a data storage engine uh, that has a lot more capabilities as well. When you're thinking about a key value store, it is a very simple solution. So you have to weigh some of the pros and cons. Uh, with a key value store, you aren't going to get access to relationships. Uh, or transactions, and it's a, it's a lookup. It's not meant to be used for querying. When we talk about Groovy and Grails, uh, there are lots of different options, especially related to Redis. Uh, so the one that I would suggest for uh, a Groovy is actually the Java uh, library, Jettis. Uh, and I put kind of in here as an update as well that this is still under active uh, development. And then Grails Redis, which is what I um, am familiar with, is, uh, has been ported to Grails 3, is under active development as well. There are some older plugins that are available as well uh, for Memcached and DynamoDB. If you're interested in uh, following up, they could definitely use your help. The next type I wanted to look at was document stores. So document stores uh, share some similarities with key value stores, but have additional capabilities as well. So you may find embedded structures. Uh, traditionally, or the ones I'm familiar with, usually use a JSON format uh, in the example like you may see here. So instead of thinking about our tables, we're thinking about documents uh, that have fields on them. Okay. Now the uses kind of increase here, so we can get things like content management systems, blogging platforms. Uh, another good use for them is to use them with forms that have optional fields. If we go back to the example here, you may notice that across the different documents, there's different fields. Some of them have uh, some fields, some have others. Document stores tend to uh, support this a little better. And it, when we look at the MongoDB example, uh, I'll point that out. It's also good when you have a frequently changing schema because you can uh, manipulate these optional fields. There are lots of different examples of document uh, stores in the, the scene. You have things like Couch, and I included Raven in here as well, depending on uh, where you're coming from. Raven is a .NET uh, solution, but it's a document store as well. Microsoft has even gone out and has a uh, hosted solution there, Azure Document DB. This is where Mongo fits in. So MongoDB is the one I'm going to use in my example, and it's uh, as the bolded one here. Okay. So when we think about document stores, uh, we have some, some trade-offs as well. You may have heard of a lot of the trade-offs, particularly as adoption of Mongo um, kind of boomed several years ago. Uh, there are good uses and bad uses. So you have to be very, very careful about choosing a NoSQL technology because uh, it's kind of like tools. So some are better for some jobs than others. And you have to think about when dealing with document databases, especially about uh, doing any kind of querying or searching across documents. Uh, things are, are very easy to, to do basic lookup. Uh, but if you need, you have highly embedded structures, you have to think about searching through those documents and it becomes less efficient. You can do use indexing, uh, especially with Mongo, that's one of the things they say, oh, well, if you've got all these embedded structures, index them. Indexing has a trade-off because it vastly increases the size of your database. Okay. 
So when we get into our space, the Groovy and Grail space, there's a Gmongo uh, plugin that was just updated in March. Uh, I didn't put it as an active because it, it doesn't have regular uh, updates, but it has been updated recently at least. The major one, MongoDB GORM, is the one I'm going to use for my example, and that has been, is updated regularly. There is an older CouchDB plugin, if anyone wants to take that on. Okay. So the third type is column families. So column families are uh, something worth noting here. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail. I've got some good resources to, to follow up later. But it's a different way of organizing data so that you have access to things in columns as well as in rows. It does have some support for uh, these optional fields as well as I've tried to, to show in my example. The use cases are very similar. Uh, things like CMS systems, blogging platforms. You can use them for log aggregators or incremental counters. Uh, Cassandra and, and other, getting ahead of myself, Cassandra uh, is definitely the most popular one. It's become popular, especially within uh, Groovy and Grails. There are other alternatives as well. Uh, we've got HBase and Hybrid Table listed here. The things to consider are that uh, it, it's a little harder to do schema changes and have some arbitrary unstructured data. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about this, uh, Jeff Beck out of Minneapolis as well did a talk at Greech on Grails and Cassandra that goes into a lot more depth on uh, column families. Okay, so we are down to graph databases. So we talked about how the first three are, are pretty similar. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about graphs. So graph databases are all about the connections between data rather than the content at the nodes. So in this example, I have the different colors for the different nodes. And nodes can be different, even completely different types. So the purple ones are the people. The blue one is our organization, great ladies. And there are lots of connections between these things. This is a very simple example. If you look more into graph databases, and especially the visualization of them, you can have these huge tree structures uh, with lots and lots of relationships. Graph databases are typically split up into uh, one of three main types. Uh, as with all NoSQL, there's or all of the solutions here. I'm just doing a, a small subset of what's available. So the, like in my example, that's a labeled property graph. So you have labels on your connections, labels on your nodes. Uh, generally, each relationship goes from one node to another. The second type is a hypergraph. So a hypergraph can have uh, many different relationships pointing to many different nodes. Uh, and then you can have triples as well. So triples use semantic uh, labeling to to kind of map out the, the transitions. If you think about how, so how would I use relationships rather than the data that's in them? There are uses in social networks. So basic connections, memberships of groups, e-commerce recommendations. So you can have uh, something like a, a shopping, app, famous shopping application, may suggest, oh, 83% uh, of the people who looked at this product also bought this with it. So you can graph out all of these relationships uh, between different products, different people, different ideas. Another good uh, example of graphing is in geolocation. Uh, you can use it for nearby locations, delivery routing, lots of different things. The main example of a graph database is Neo4j. There are some other alternatives as well, but Neo4j is definitely the most popular. If you're interested in learning more about graph databases, Neo4j has uh, sponsored the release of the, I can't remember the publisher right now, I'm sorry, uh, the, a new book on, on graph databases, and it's completely free uh, thanks to, to Neo4j. When you consider 
a graph database, it's very important to think about how you're architecting your application and how you're architecting how the data fits together. Because as you get these big structures, uh, any kind of a deep tree traversal is going to add overhead. And I do have it asterisked here because graph databases uh, map out relationships between data a heck of a lot better than relational. And some of the ways that graph databases are implemented, they are actually just indexes over relational databases rather than a native uh, graph database. And that definitely affects this tree traversal. For me, it was also a very different way of thinking about data. We're used to thinking, or at least I am, used to thinking of it in a very tabular format where it's the fields and the columns and the, that's the data that I'm focused on. Thinking about those relationships is, a, is definitely a change in mindset. Okay. So the libraries and plugins. Uh, Neo4j, actually I should put that in here, Neo4j has a native REST API. And this is something I didn't really mention on the, the other ones. Some NoSQL solutions, you may not need a plugin or a library to use. Some have REST APIs that you can access as well. There is a Neo4j uh, GORM plugin that was last updated uh, in June of 2014. Okay. So, that was just a basic overview of some NoSQL uh, definitions, some types. If you'd like to learn more, there's uh, lots of books and lots of, of links uh, to other material as well. So probably the question that everyone's looking for, how do I pick just one? You don't. <laughs> so I've got this tool set here. I uh, started this example a little earlier that the NoSQL solutions are adding to your tool set. Just like you wouldn't use a hammer for everything, you don't use the same data solution for everything. So there are two main tactics uh, that I've used in my examples. The first one is your all-in approach. So something as in MongoDB uh, has a GORM plugin. So you can switch out the entire uh, GORM system to use MongoDB. So how many people here are kind of familiar with MongoDB already? Okay, so probably about half. So MongoDB has a couple different uh, ideas. Uh, the first thing is your terminology. So databases, that's still the same, but instead of thinking of tables, they're collections, something fairly similar to all, or familiar to all of us. Instead of referring to rows, we have documents. Okay. So let's take a look. I'm going to exit here. Okay. So I do have these examples set up on different Git branches. I'm going to go ahead and get that started. The thing, so this is a Mongo management tool, uh, just to, to kind of visualize what's going on uh, here. So I've just refreshed this. The only thing in here is, are the local uh, logs for this, this Mongo instance. Okay. Once we get this running, if I refresh this, Mongo goes in, and some of the NoSQL solutions as well, only create it when it's needed. So when the application started, then it went in and created the database with all of these, uh, this data pre-populated. I, I used a bootstrap file to kind of populate some of this data. Okay. So at this point, i um, going to look at the Gradle file. So if you haven't had a, a chance to look at Grails 3 yet, uh, some things in here have changed. The only thing that I have done at this point after, so I did Grails create app, I've put in all of my, my other example application code. 
At this point, the only thing I've done is add the Mongo plugin. I haven't changed any of my code uh, or done anything else. And right out of the box, this um, started and worked, which is a really nice thing. Uh, we're used to, when we learned Groovy and Rails, going from, from Java to Groovy, and you slowly transition things. You can take the same approach to something like a Mongo Gorm. OK. So let's exit this and go back in here. So this has restarted, so I don't have anything in the cart again. Um, and please stop me if you can't see anything, because that would be um, detrimental. So we're back to our original thing. Like I said, everything still works exactly as I expected it to. If I go in and look at what's in here, this I probably need to zoom in. We get, uh, and there's different views to, to do this, but we think of it as, as JSON. And we have IDs, everything is in here, but it's still very flat. Um, it's not idiomatic Mongo yet. We have, uh, the vendor is still a reference to vendor. The other thing we look over here, there's no cart. So just like the database was created when we need it, the cart and its items won't be created until I add something in. So if I go back here, oh, now I'm zoomed in. I'm going to add some stickers to my cart. I can see that they're here. If I refresh, we now have Sorry, too much. Uh, some data for, for the cart. Another thing uh, to look at while we're in here is the difference between these different uh, things. So in, when I have the stickers, I have a reference to their image location. But on the t-shirts, I don't. And none of that uh, is, matters to the application. We've got the optional fields. So the next step would be to look at a little bit more into what we can do to make it more like Mongo. So I'm going to check out the Mongo Finish branch, which is where I, um, I'm not going to attempt uh, to live code. <laughs> so I have this uh, all pre-done. I'm sorry? Yes. Okay. Um, actually. Okay. So I need to drop this between so that it um, does differently. Okay. Uh, shoot, I didn't think about this window. Nope. That didn't work. Um, I'm typing Grails run app. Thanks, sorry. This hasn't started. Okay, there we go. So if I go back, this is all of the same um, code. I have um, products here. So as you see, I have condensed this down into to one collection, the product. And it, let's look at. The, oh. So some things have changed here. When we looked at the example before, uh, out of the box, it was still using the integer notation and having to keep track of that in a separate collection 
Each one was product next ID, uh, cart next ID, was adding extra overhead. It's because but Mongo, uh, by default, uses BSON, which is a variation of JSON, and prefers to use the BSON object ID. When we do this in Grails, uh, by default, it's, it still can use the regular numbers, but you can also switch out to use the, the native Mongo object ID by including it here. Um, and then you see it on the, the product. The other thing that we did in here, uh, or I didn't hear, was embedded. So uh, you may be familiar with embedded already, but uh, underneath that, uh, in, in the way it's in Mongo, actually makes it as part of the embedded structure that we'll look at. I embedded the vendor and the price quantity relations. So an interesting thing to note here is that, uh, and you may ask, when should you embed something and when should you keep it separate? Something like a vendor, uh, you may not want to. It's going to be extra overhead. And something consistent across many NoSQL technologies is that you may end up with duplicate data. Uh, so if you have the vendor repeated on each and every uh, collection, you're adding overhead. When you go to update information, you then have to update all of the records rather than having it in a central place. Um, Whereas something like the price quantity relation makes more sense to embed because that is specific to the individual document. Uh, there isn't too much sharing across the, the price and quantity relationships. Okay. Uh, I did something similar for cart, so I added in the object ID and embedded cart items into the, the cart. I also changed the name of the database while I was in there. I didn't show the uh, Gradle file, or the config file. OK, so this I need to increase. OK. So here we have a little bit different structure. It's changed from a numeric ID to being the object ID. Um, highlight it there. And then we have these price quantity relations that are embedded in here. Uh, so price, quantity, and then unit price, just examples of how this might look. I also did this for the vendor. Something else you might want to do if you want uh, would be to move some specific information into to there. Should look pretty similar across all of them, uh, similar to what we looked at before. Shouldn't be everything on the Mongo. Okay. So, reminders to myself we've gone over that everything's created when it needed to be the database and the collections. Uh, fields, if they don't exist, they aren't created. We don't have all of these columns with null values, it just doesn't exist. And that you may want to use BSON object IDs over integers. So that was approach one, where you replace everything. You may also use a more fine-tuned precision tool and just replace part of your application. So this is where I'm going to use the, the Grails Redis plugin to just substitute out the shopping cart portion rather than the entire uh, application. Okay. So Redis start. Here. This is here. So rather than uh, using GORM, it's the Redis GORM plugin. Actually, I should, sorry, let me back up. Go over Redis first. How many people are familiar with Redis or a, a different related key value store? Okay. 
fewer people. So Redis has some different technology, or different terminology, I'm sorry. Uh, you have keys, and then Azure values, you can store different types of data. So you can store strings, hashes, and sets. Um, and if we go to redis.io slash commands, there's some pretty good documentation. We can look at how um, sets and hashes have different uh, commands based on, on what type of value you're, you're looking at. Okay. So this is back up and running. The start at this point, all I've done is include the uh, the plugin. Haven't made any code changes yet. Everything still works. Um, a theme. So looking at this, there there are no changes. Um, So RDM is a, the Redis Desktop Manager. It's a, another visualization tool for, for Redis. Uh, it is available cross-platform cross if anyone uses Redis. So Redis has different databases. Uh, by default, it's going to go in here. But you see there's nothing in here yet. We haven't done anything. So this is initial what it, what it looks like when it starts. OK. So again, not going to live, <laughs> try to live code this. I went to my finish branch okay, and get that started. So I'm not using the GORM anymore. I'm going to Redis, the Redis Grails plugin. Uh, Works at th that's not good. Okay, uh, so while well, that's restarting, so it works by dependency or uh, service injection. You include the Redis service, and hopefully we can get the controller to actually look at it this time. So I abstracted this out. Um, I included a cart service, and then I'll go into presentation. Okay, I'm going to try this one more time and then I'm going to go into a different thing. No. So let's go to GitHub. Go to let's finish. Products is my girl's application. I probably should have said that at one point. Um, okay. Girls app controllers. We looked at the cart controller. Services. That's what I was looking at. Okay. So I created this other service, uh, and all it does is inject in this Redis service. Because I'm not using standard GORM, I then have to create all of these other methods that I can use instead. So to get the cart, and doing some things in here I wouldn't suggest, uh, but Redis service, and then you just, most of the commands that are available for regular Redis are uh, in this Grails Redis plugin and accessible by the, the same names. One of the things that I did, so if you have multiple um, stores that you're doing in, in Redis, you may want to preface your keys, and uh, you can do uh, anything, colon, anything, and you'll just have this long string that you can, makes it easier to, to query and find. Uh, so I preface this with cart, and then 
like I said, I was using the lazy way. I was using the session ID as the unique identifier. One of the other things about this, so uh, you can expire them after 30 minutes, something you may want to do with a, a shopping cart. Everything is directly accessible here. Okay. Uh, Dell, delete, hopefully. Uh, so S add, set add, uh, adding. So when you add to the cart, it's adding some object into into a key value. And it's I'm just using the the ID. So you can have a relational database storing your products and then just have references to that in another data store. Okay. The other thing in here uh, to note is the expiration. So some other sort of, you may get key expiration built in. So in this case after 1800 seconds, the, the key will just expire and go away. Uh, don't have enough time to show that, but trust me. <laughs> um, you, can, you can try it on the example. Okay. No, where's my? So Redis still doesn't have anything because I haven't added anything to the cart. The rest of the data is still all in here. So if I go, actually, it's probably going to log me out and make me sign back in because I've restarted the application. So the products and all of this is still in our in-memory H2 database. Uh, the thing here, when we get to the cart, there's nothing in here and nothing will be in there because we've, I've moved that functionality. So I'm going to add this in, and actually this is, re okay, actually it worked. Uh, so I have some stickers in my cart. If I go in here, there's still nothing here because it has moved. To be here, which is just a reference. Um, you can put almost anything in there that you want. This, if you notice, was also just rather than having a one to one, you can have a one to many. So let me zoom back out. If I now go back and add some t shirts, I now have two things in the cart. Refresh this. So there's one cart, but you have multiple items in there. So you've got the ability to have, have those one-to-many relationships. Okay. So that is the example of Redis. Okay. So things I've uh, gone over. So it's organized by keys, uh, which are just basic lookups. You get access to most basic CRUD operations. You can add things, remove things. Uh, you can also have key expiration in that this idea of a second or alternate approach is that it's service level rather than replacing all of GORM. Okay. So in conclusion, uh, picking a NoSQL solution depends on the problem. Not every tool is the right one for every job. But if you are looking for a NoSQL solution, there are, they are many different options, and they are good options. And within our community, there are several uh, plugins, libraries that are, that are widely supported in both Groovy and Grails. Okay. So now you can ask questions or look at awkward pictures of my cats. <laughs> Guess we're going with the cats. <laughs> How do you configure the data source of the Redis service? How do you configure your... Oh. Let's see if WebStorm will behave. Um, yeah, so I haven't, I, I should set it up in IntelliJ. I've been doing some Angular work lately and don't have IntelliJ set up on this machine. Uh, okay. 
So I, I should still be in the resident branch. Well, actually, I don't think I have an example in this one. I have one in Mongo, because um, I'm just using the standard Redis configuration. Uh, it's all localhost. Uh, but you, there are configuration options that you can add to your, well, and now data source is no longer. But uh, let's look at the Mongo one. The only thing I did in Mongo was change the database name because by default it was test. Uh, okay, so we switched to application.yaml for uh, this. And so here, um, it's a MongoDB connection string. You can still do all of your dev specific things. Uh, if you wanted to configure Redis in a different way, uh, there are configuration options done this similarly. Yes? Right. Mm -hmm. So, pretty similar argument to getting Groovy over Java. Um, it's about the right solution for the right uh, use. It, this is what I was talking about with the situation with Mongo. A lot of people jumped on board with Mongo at first, but we're using it for banking and transactions that. Uh, because Mongo does a lot of stuff in memory, and if that uh, fails before it writes to disk, you lose all of this data. So some of those things uh, have, have definitely hurt NoSQL in general. And as far as, I mean, it, some of them are older than others. Some of uh, these predate some of our, our current relational uh, databases. I'm blanking on the examples I was reading. Uh, Your question was uh, whether they're mature, uh, and some of that is, it, it varies a lot. Um, the other thing was how to get it into enterprise, and um, enterprises have a... Right. Sure. Sure. Uh, I know some operations people who are more familiar with uh, NoSQL technologies. It's a much smaller skill set. When I was doing Mongo work, we were using a paid hosted solution. Uh, so we were paying DBAs to do all the maintenance and, and uh, manage the scaling and all of that. Uh, there are lots of companies that do that. that offer those services if you wanted to do some of that in-house because of your enterprise roles, uh, you'd have to, to get the talent, uh, which may be a, a, bl a blocker. Yes? So, I mean, transactions, especially if you're doing it across uh, documents in Mongo. Yeah, it doesn't. Um, it, it is what I was, was going to build up to. And that, so that's, that's why it was such a, a bad thing for banking, is that you would get uh, fa critical failures in, in the middle of a transaction and, and have, have issues. Yes? Sure. So that's actually something I didn't uh, talk about. So Elasticsearch ends up being a more of a search indexing rather than a, a data storage solution. Uh, I mean, you could, but uh, definitely more of a, a, a searching. 
I'll go back to it if you need. Uh, searching rather than your, your primary data, data source. You could have, I've done a, a multi tiered uh, solution where we had Mongo as an oper oh, that's what I was looking for. Operation, these are operational uh, database solutions. And then uh, we'd have some sort of connector that would feed into Elasticsearch to, to be, and that's reading rather than writing, and there's all kinds of different things in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what we're doing. And how did that work for operational, like, rights rather than over time? Oh, 